I'm looking at how we can use machine learning to track financial markets, essentially. And what I'm really interested in, how we can use financial markets and find the link that they have to environmental change. Uh, because if you look at it, financial markets are closely tied to whatever the land grows. Uh, we are all always going to need food. And um, because climate change directly affects our food production chains, it has consequences for financial markets. So what I am trying to build up towards is how we can make a language of climate change which does translate readily to financial markets because they can be a very big driver of change. So before I go into all of that, let me give you a very brief history of artificial intelligence. So this here very nicely <laughs> sums up what artificial intelligence does. We create a lot of hype, then we fail people's expectations, and we repeat that all over again. Um, what happened in 1943 was that scientists developed the first thing called a neural network. What they tried to do was copy a neuron. They tried to <coughs> copy a brain circuit into a computer program. Then along came Alan Turing and wrote his very seminal paper in which he proposed the Turing test, which I hope a lot of science sci-fi movies have told you what it is. Uh, Turing test is when a machine completely succeeds in fooling a human into believing that that machine is a person. Um, in 1956, the field of artificial intelligence was officially created as a field. And um, in 1966, the field officially failed DARPA's translation test. So one of the nice things that, uh, one of the nice lines from that time is that um, translation was really bad. So I wrote here, good vodka and bad idiots. So you know the saying, out of sight, out of mind. So if you translate it back and forth between <coughs> Russian and English, slowly it became uh, blind idiots. Out of sight, blind, out of mind, idiots. And so there was another phrase which was, the will is strong, but the flesh is weak. And translated back and forth between uh, English and Russian, it became the vodka is good, but the meat is bad. <laughs> <laughs> and now you might wonder why we'd be so interested in translating Russian to English. It was a Cold War era, and translating Russian documents very quickly was really essential. And so that has been the story essentially of artificial intelligence that it goes through winters. Whenever it fails, funding dries up, a winter comes. And in 1973, a winter came. In 1980s, as Microsoft and other companies were sort of gaining footing, artificial intelligence saw a surge. There was a thing called expert systems, which was one of the first known implementations of something people readily identified as artificial intelligence. But then along came the personal computer, out went uh, expensive machines, and in 1987, we had a winter again. But behind the scenes, Microsoft was building computers, and in 1996, Gary Kasparov's chess match really brought artificial intelligence into the public glamour all over again. And in 2007, DARPA introduced the Grand Challenge, which was to navigate a car completely based on some sort of software. And that car challenge has translated into Google's driverless car today. Now Google today has, in 2014, acquired a thing called DeepMind, which essentially goes all the way back to that 1943 technology and they use a thing called deep neural networks, where they're essentially trying to recreate a neuron style mind network to solve the problem of artificial intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence can be intractable on many levels. You can have theoretical intractability where a, a problem just can't be solved, even in the asymptotic mathematical limit. But then there is mathematical inter intractability. Our mathematics might not just be strong enough at the current stage to solve a lot of these problems. But we are somehow, somewhat seeing improvements in mathematics every day. So artificial intelligence really benefits from statistics and mathematics discoveries every day. And there are some computational challenges. So sometimes your computer is just not good enough to implement good code. And so as you make leaps and bounds in these fields, artificial intelligence moves forward. Now, the main thing that I want to talk about is, can we create sustainable markets and will it lead to sustainable in environments? And why I have that hypothesis is that, fundamentally, there is a lot of rhetoric on both sides that is contradictory. It, it is paradoxical in some senses, but a lot of times it speaks across each other. A lot of our markets need a lot of growth for 
a lot of metrics that we have, GDP being one of the more problematic ones, but a lot of environment needs sustainability-based rhetoric. And so how do we reconcile them? And so one thing that I'm trying to find out in my research is that can we use these really nice artificial intelligence machine learning models and find these linkages? And can we then prove that a sustainable market model really leads to a sustainable environment as well and vice versa? So initially my re re research focused on just estimating financial market risk and moving away from very traditional economic models of it. I said, I'm an engineer, I'm dumb about markets. Can I use my program to discover some ground truths? And there are some interesting things that do happen in the markets, why they can be quantified. So one interesting thing is the Anne Hathaway effect. So what happens is every time an Anne Hathaway movie comes out, Berkshire Hathaway, which is a, a, a British company, its stocks go up 2.2% usually. Why that happens is because Anne Hathaway's movies create a lot of social media buzz. And there are algorithms out there who are trading on social media buzz. And so whenever they see the name Hathaway being picked up, they buy Hathaway seal. Okay. Wow, I'm already finishing. <laughs> okay. Let me then breathe through a lot of this and come to this. This is what happened in January 1992. Rubber duckies, a lot of them, sunk in the ocean and then they have been landing on our coasts a lot, uh, different times and different amounts. And that helped us study ocean currents. And so information in markets actually travels in a similar way. It doesn't travel instantaneously. Sometimes it reaches some places faster and some places it reaches slow. What we are trying to do is quantify that travel of information from climate to financial markets. So one thing that I'm trying to look at is how does heavy rainfall in Australia affect the New York Stock Exchange? Because Australia is the first, second or third producer in a lot of things, wheat, crude oil. And when these things are affected by climate change, they do affect commodity risk. And so we are trying to see if we can quantify that risk and speak the language of people who are trading on the markets and therefore make a case for them moving towards a sustainable environment. Thank you.